Ezekiel 33, verse 10 and 11. I, um, I have a floodgate of scriptures today. And I feel like just reading through the host of them in somewhat a teaching format, but a charge is I pray for any service I don't, I don't look up online to download some sermon from somewhere or get something from headquarters to preach and and minister. I, I pray. I seek the Lord. I want to know what the Spirit is saying to the Jesus Church in Watertown. And the Lord began to speak to me and gave me some direction, but it was a cascade, an avalanche of scriptures that I feel compelled to read. And I believe that if our hearts are open and receptive, that God will speak. God will minister to you as you need today, as he sees fit, as he desires. Ezekiel 33, 10 and 11. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, if our transgressions and our sins be upon us, there is a weight that comes from Sin from transgression. The image here is a load pressing down upon the one carrying the burden. This is not a good burden. This is sin. This is transgression. And it is pressing upon those that would carry it. And it says those that would carry it. Not only is the load upon them. It says we pine away in them. Literally melting, dissolving, corroding, coming to naught. That which you had over time is withering away. Knowing that sin has a weight, that sin has a far greater weight than a gravitational pull. It is an eternal pull that it not only puts a burden on you, it literally corrodes everything about you. You ever see somebody that has lived in a particular vice of sin for an extended period of time, you see the toll that it takes upon their body. You see the effects upon their face, upon their skin, upon their countenance. This is the effect of sin. And with this to consider, he poses this question, the prophet of God, Ezekiel, how should we then live? Would you say that with me? How should we then live? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. If you ever want to know what God's will is, what God's heart it is, not some sadistic creator that has power that sits back and laughs at his creation as it is under the weight of sin, as it is corroding from the effects of sin. This creator, this God, this all powerful being is also a heavenly father. And he has great compassion towards his creation. And his will, his desire is not the pleasure in the death of the wicked, but to see the wicked turn from his way and to live. And so he cries out, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? I want to just talk and read through scripture today from this simple question that the prophet posed under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. How should we then live? Would you pray with me, church? God, I I ask, Lord, that you would open up our ears and our minds. I feel a burden on my heart. Lord, I feel an unction of the Holy Ghost that is in this place. I pray, God, every hard heart would be softened today. Every calloused eye, Lord, the scale would come off. Every plugged ear, God, would open up today. And I pray, Jesus, that there would go forth a ministering spirit in the house of God. I pray, Lord, that we would be open, receptive, and, Lord, that we would apply your word. And somebody say in Jesus' name. Hebrews eleven thirty three in reading. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, 
obtain promises. Stop the mouths of lions. Quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Wax valiant in fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Women receive their dead or raised to life again. Others, someone say others. We've read a group of people in this hall of faith that seem to overcome their struggles. But then there's others who are tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all referring to the others. They obtained a good report through faith. It would seem to be a bad report if you were to receive that letter in your mailbox about a Christian brother, sister, family, friend that you know serving the Lord, being executed for their faith. But the Bible says they received a good report through their faith. But it almost seems even counterproductive here or maybe anticlimactic for it to say that they receive not the promise. All of that work, all of that sacrifice, everything, they were all in and they didn't even get the promise. And in verse 40, it says God has provided some better thing for us. This host, this litany, this group of people that have literally gave their all And did not receive a promise. And then it would say that God has given you something better than them. Because without us, they should not be made perfect. It seems like an amazing group of people that we read about. But the Bible says there is another generation that is to be born. That is alive today. That there is a better thing. And that without us, those that gave their all would be incomplete without this final chapter. This 11th hour group that I stand before today. It is not in terms or regards to superiority or inferiority. It's just a matter of it's the body. We all need, we all complete, we all are part of the story that God so loved that he gave, that he birthed this church, that without the final chapter of the church, the beginning chapter of the church is incomplete. You think about what these people gave. You think about their sacrifice. And then you think about us. It goes on without pause in chapter 12, verse 1. That we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Meaning, look around this group in Hebrews 11 that we just read about. in every historical figure in the Bible that you have read about that you see as a hero. It says they are watching you. We are surrounded by their sacrifice. We are surrounded by the evidence of their faith. And so the least we can do that are given an hour of a better thing, that are given an hour to complete a thing, the least we can do is lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. They that gave their all For a generation today that is reluctant to give some. That ought to challenge us to the core of our being. That if there is a group like that. If there is a generation like that. And yet they are incomplete without us. And we are they upon whom the ends of the world have come. I don't want to fall short of the sacrifice. We read in Ezekiel about the tremendous weight. Of sin that pines away upon those that carry that burden 
of sin. And in the Hebrews Hall of Faith here, it says, look, the best thing you can do right now is lay aside that weight, that transgression, that burden that presses you down because it sets you off course. It slows you down. Let us lay it aside. And let's run with patience the race that is set before us. So let's look to Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. You may not enjoy every aspect of living for God, but neither did Jesus. But he understood that the cause was worth the cost. As Pastor Jared talked about that phrase and statement in this morning's class, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and consider him. Consider what Jesus did and what he endured. It was a contradiction of sinners against himself. Everything that came his way contradicted what he deserved. But if we would consider the price that he paid and what he went through, it says if we would do that, we would not be wearied. We would not be faint in our minds. We are not in a day and age, at least in North America, where the physical persecution is there, but there is the mental onslaught that continually wearies and faints our minds. Would we consider Jesus for just a moment? Can we lift our hands and consider Jesus for just a moment? Every weary thought you've had, every heavy burden you've carried, I wonder if the church can consider Jesus. Consider Jesus, who for the contradiction of sinners, he took all of that upon him. Consider Jesus. It goes on to say in verse 4, as now the man of God even more clearly and directly speaks to us today. He says, you, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Meaning what you are up against, you have not paid the price that those that are compassed about you have paid. They fought till the death. They stood for truth till the death. And here we are that we can be so quick sometimes and we can entertain the thought of quitting, giving up. Just what's the use? What's the point? Why even try? But it says, look, we have not resisted unto blood like our forefathers and ancestors fighting the fight against sin as we fight the good fight of faith. We have nowhere near paid the price of those who have gone before us. And when I read that list of people, it provokes my thoughts. It stirs my emotions. It is sad. It is stirring. But we must understand it is rewarding. For the Bible says in Psalm 116, verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Hebrews 9, 27 and as it is appointed unto men once to die, everybody here under the sound of my voice, it is appointed for us. We will die one day if we are not alive when Jesus Christ comes back for his church. But it says after that death, there is the judgment. Romans 2.16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. By Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. That verse haunts and reverberates through my mind to even think that every secret, everything that is in my life that nobody knows about. That once I die, there is the judgment and I will stand before Jesus Christ and he will judge the secrets of men. Second Corinthians 5, 10 and 11 goes on. It says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I'm asking one ultimate question today is how should we then live Knowing that 
we are alive and we remain currently. But it is appointed to every single person in this room to die. And after death, there is the judgment. Everybody, as we read in scripture, is going to be judged. If you are not too familiar what happens in the afterlife, you will read about two judgments. There is the judgment seat of Christ and there is the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ, everybody is going to stand before Jesus that is part of the church and they will give an account of the things done in their body, whether it's good or bad. We'll go on to read here in just a moment and there will be tears. There will be regrets, but there will not be loss of the soul. That soul will be able to enter into the joy of the Lord for all of eternity. But for those not part of the church, the Bible says they will stand before the great white throat judgment before they are put to their ultimate sentence and they will have their day in court just like everybody does. And they will stand before the author, the finisher. They will stand before the judge of the quick and the dead. And he will tell them why they are going where they are going. God will not send anyone into judgment without letting them know as to why they are being judged. And then they will be sent out into eternity for all of time where there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. It sounds horrific. Why would you dare preach about it? Because it is in the Bible. We are not to be an organization, a religion, a group of people that pick and choose doctrines in the Bible one over the other simply to accommodate our conscience or emotion. But as Paul said on the day of his departure from the people of God, he says, I have declared to you the full counsel of God. I want to be free of the blood of all men. And you cannot be free of the blood of all men unless you have declared the full counsel of God. We are asking one question with this in mind. How should we then live? Knowing that we are alive, knowing that we will die, knowing there is eternity. So how should we then live? And from this one question, I want to, uh, us to consider seven questions. And that is this. Number one, how should we then live in words? How should we then live in our words? Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34 through 37, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, but an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Words, words. What words do we use in the life that we live right now? Does it even matter? They're just words. But Jesus says in verse 36, I say unto you, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. I ask those that are here today and alive, how shall we then live in our words knowing what we know? Number two, the second question is how should we then live in thoughts? As we see Jesus stated that our words absolutely matter. But the word of the Lord declares that our thoughts matter as well. Proverbs 15, 26 and Proverbs 24 and 9. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. And in verse 9 of Proverbs 24, the thought of foolishness is sin. How should we then live in our thoughts? In our day-to-day -day life of how we talk, how should we be speaking? In our day-to-day -day life of walking across this place, how should we be thinking? I want to make sure every thought that I have is a godly thought, is a pure thought, is a holy thought. It does not mean that there is not traffic that goes through the thought world of my mind. But I must take control and I must interject or intersect and intercept any thought that comes through this mind. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 5. Yes, we're walking in the flesh, but our war is more than just the flesh. It says that we need to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every 
every single thought needs to be captured and brought down. As it says in Philippians chapter 4, it says that we need to whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honest, whatsoever is just, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I encourage you as you ponder this question, and I pray you ponder it and you're not passive today, that you would ponder how shall I then live in my words and how shall I live in my thoughts? Thoughts have consequences. Thoughts have an effect that play out. The third question, how should we then live in relationships? One with another. In the church, outside the church, Matthew 5, 21 through 24, you have heard it said by them of old time, do not kill. Amen. And whoever kills is in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking. Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever is angry, says to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. This is Jesus speaking, New Testament grace, by the way, just to fill you in. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that thy brother hath ought against thee. See, sometimes it's it's not just about one, you know, you you saying, well, you know, I, 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 I don't have anything against them. But if they have something against you, there still ought to be an effort on your part if you know about it. What can I do about it? Knowing about it. And it says, if you know that, leave your gift at the altar. And he says here in verse 14 of Matthew 6, the next chapter, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Why would he be so emphatic upon this? Because we live in a day and age where forgiveness in relationships has become an increasing problem. It was a problem then. It is a problem now. And I just don't want this church to ever be deceived that your relationships between one another in this room and your relationships between people outside of this room, it matters to God. It is not that we live to ourselves and die to ourselves. For the scripture declares quite the opposite, that no man lives to himself and no man dies to himself, knowing that we are in the last days, knowing that eternity is upon us. How should we then live in our words, in our thoughts, in our relationships? Question number four, how should we then live In lifestyle. How should we then live in our lifestyle? Hebrews 12, 14, 15. Follow peace with all men. Which it stems and continues from what we just read a moment ago. How can you live peaceably with someone that you have not forgiven or has not forgiven you? There is no peace in that situation. And it says, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And if we don't look diligently into this, that men can fail of the grace of God. I know there is a common teaching that is out there that you have this grace of God and you can live however you want, once saved, always saved, doesn't matter. But that is counter to Scripture. The Scripture explicitly states time and time again of our responsibility of dying to this flesh and living and walking in this grace of God. He, uh, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You got to read the whole verse. You got to read the whole book. And there is this here in scripture where we can fail from the grace of God. And because of that, a a bitterness springs up troubles. And it says many be defiled 
for many to be defiled, then we ought to talk about it all the more often. There ought to be more peace. There ought to be peace in the church. There ought to be unity in the church. There ought to be forgiveness in the church. And there ought to be peace in your home. There ought to be unity in your home. There ought to be forgiveness in your home. There ought to be peace in your family. There ought to be unity in your family. There ought to be forgiveness in your family. We're just reading the Bible here. Question number five. How should we then live in salvation? Those that have experienced that born again message. That Acts 2.38 is that was preached on the very first birthday of the church. How shall we live in salvation? It says, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, meaning that you ought to live for God, not just when the preacher's around, not just when you're in church attendance. You ought to live for God in your personal life. And it says this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It ought to be the most serious thing in your life. It ought to be the most serious subject matter in your life. That in your privacy, in your going in and going out, that you are putting forth a diligent effort in how you live for God with fear and trembling. Because there is a God in verse 13 that wants to work in you. He wants to work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Not to do things with murmurings and disputings, but you can live a life without murmuring and disputing. Question number six, will my temporal endure the eternal? Will my temporal endure the eternal? First Corinthians three eleven through 17. For other foundation can no man lay than it is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, he named six things that you could draw a line down the middle about the material and the value of those materials quite clearly here. And it says every work man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare there is coming a day. It will be revealed by fire. The fire will try every man's work to see what sort it is. Which category does it fall into, the former or the latter? Does it fall into the gold, silver, precious stone? Or does it fall into the ladder of wood, hay, and stubble? The fire will let you know. But you can work on it before the fire works on it. Right here, right now, in this life. The Bible says this here in verse 14. If your work abides that you have built thereon, you will receive a reward. But if your work is burned up, you will suffer loss. Now, in case you got alarmed and worried and considered or disagreed with the idea and concept of being in heaven and suffering loss and having tears and regret, this is the scripture in the New Testament from the word of the Lord, from the Apostle Paul. He says there will be a suffering of a loss in heaven, but he himself can still be saved, yet as so by fire. It says, don't you know, church, you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. So let's not defile the temple of God. I don't want God to destroy me because I have misused and abused this temple for this temple is holy, which temple you are. And question number seven, how should we then live in light of eternity? Isaiah 5, 14 says, hell has enlarged herself. Hell has opened her mouth without measure. All the glory of this world, sadly, the multitude, their pomp, those that seem to be having a good time rejoicing now, descend into it. If that is just your idea of some angry God in the Old Testament, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter into that straight gate. Wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. 
and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads unto life. And few there be that find it. What I pose to you in question seven is you might have answered some of these questions right, and hopefully you are. And hopefully question number five applies to you where you are saved. But question number seven provokes you beyond your own salvation. It is on those without salvation. That hell is getting larger and wider. It is enlarging itself, and there are many that are pouring into this horrific place that Jesus Christ himself talked about. So we go back to the question, ultimately, how should we then live? Knowing that there is a pressing weight of sin on this world and that there is a pining away of this world, how should we then live? An enemy of how we should live is the hope that will start tomorrow. Hear me again as I state that I don't want you to miss it. That an enemy of how we live is the hope that will start right tomorrow. You ought not to bank on tomorrow to get things figured out. We only have right Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 27 in verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We are not promised our next breath. We are not promised the next day. In the New Testament, James 4, 13 through 17, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city, and we'll continue there a year. We'll buy, we'll sell, we'll get gain. Whereas you do not know what will be on the morrow. What is your life? This question is important to answer. Your life is but a vapor. Just like in South Dakota, as the temperature change, you step outdoors, you open your mouth, and you see that cloud of smoke exit. And no sooner than it exits, it dissipates and it is gone. That is what your life is. That is what my life is. It appears for a little time, it vanishes away. And so for that, this is how we ought to say. This is how we then should live. If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But the problem is James is talking to the church. He says, you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. You have this confidence about you that I, I'll start doing this down the road. I'll take care of this next week. I'll take care of this after, you know, I, I, I get this relationship figured out. I'll take care of this when I'll see them, you know, a couple months down from now. I'll take care of this when my job or when I move or when I this, that or the other. There's always something about the future that's in our minds as a people because we've lived in so many yesterdays that we think we have tomorrow and without a worry, without question, without doubt. But hear me in the Holy Ghost. To have that assumption is a false assumption. And so he concludes the thought with this statement in verse 17. So to know to do good and to not do it, that is sin. To assume that you have tomorrow to work on it. To assume that you got next week to figure it out. To assume that you got next month to start working on the situation. It says that is an evil thought. That is an incorrect thought. That is a false notion. And to know what to do and to just put it off. To you, mister, it is sin. To you, it is rebellion. It is evil. It is wickedness. It is not of God, I'm telling you right now, the best thing that we could ever do is figure out how we should live right now. Right now, I want to get right with God. Right now, I want to make this with right with God. Right now, I want to get my relationship worked on. Right now, I want to lay this burden down. Right now, I want to lay this weight down. Right now, I want to lay this sin down. It's been setting me off track for way too long. Would you lift your hands? Ha! Hallelujah! 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 
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Mm. Second Peter 3, 1. Through a, I told you got a lot of verses. I'm almost done, though, believe it or not. Verse 18, 1 through 18. Peter writes a second time, beloved, I now write unto you in both which to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, the commandment of us, the apostles, and the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. And these scoffers in the last days, oh, where's the promise of his coming? Since all these old timers fell asleep and died, things continue as they always continue since the beginning of time. But it says in verse 5, they, they are willingly ignorant of. By the word of God, the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens of the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment, perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. God's not a procrastinator. To understand why things have gone on as long as we think they have gone on is because God is long-suffering to usward. He's patient. He's merciful. He's not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night when you least expect it. The heavens pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, the works that are therein shall be burned up. So pay attention here, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, conversation and behavior? How should we then live knowing what's coming ahead of us? Looking for, hasting unto the coming of the day of God. I'm looking for Jesus to come back. The heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. The elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven, a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Look at verse 14, 15. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. God, his whole motive of delaying the whole thing, his motive is salvation. Because he doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he wants to see them turn and turn and turn. In verse 16, he goes on to, or we'll go, yeah, um, let's go to verse 17, or yeah, verse 16. And also in all his epistles, speaking to them of these things, in which some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before. You say, oh, I heard it before. Well, Peter still repeated himself anyways. Beware, lest you also. You know these things, you've heard them before, but beware, lest you also. Well, I've heard this before, I'm right, no big deal. No, you know these things, but beware, lest ye also. Being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Once again, another apostle in the New Testament says, look, you can fall, you can fade, you can backslide, or verse 18, you can grow in grace. You can, I choose to grow in grace. I choose to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 12 through 21. I just got two portions of scriptures left. I don't mean to say this is a new living translation that I have already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. Paul says this. He goes, look, I know I'm preaching hard. I'm preaching direct, but I want you to understand that I don't claim to have arrived, but I do know that I press on to possess that perfection for which Jesus Christ first possessed me. I'm apprehended. I want to apprehend by that which has apprehended me. I want to get a hold of what's got a hold of me. I love him because he first loved me. That's why I'm pressing. That's why I'm striving. That's why I'm reaching is because he reached for me and got a hold on me. And I have not yet exited this temporal and entered into the eternal. So I'm reaching as best I can in the temporal to get a hold of the eternal and to store up treasures in heaven. That's 
That's what I want to do currently. That's what I want to do in the finite, in the mortal, in the temporal. I want to store treasures in heaven. I want to tap in to the eternal. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. I forget the past. I look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you don't agree what was preached today, I want to encourage you right now. The mature thing that you can do right now is agree on these things. And if you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. God will make it known to you because that's what the Lord wants to do. Far too often we get flustered and frustrated and we quit even trying to learn and grow in the grace of God when the Bible says, look, God wants to make it plain to you. Just do the mature thing. Agree. Follow. Listen. Yield. Submit. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Church, hear me in the Holy Ghost right now. We have made progress. We have moved forward. We have grown. We've seen some victories. Let's hold on to that progress right now. Let's make sure we agree on these things. Things. We have not yet apprehended everything that has apprehended us, but I'm pressing towards it. I'm reaching towards it. It's what motivates me. How I currently live is because God has got a hold of me. Let's lift our hands. Let's lift our voices. Hallelujah, Jesus. Ha ha ha. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I worship you, God. I magnify you, Father. I praise you, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. Dear brothers and sisters, verse 17, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really the enemies of the cross of Christ. Conduct matters. You can say anything you want with your mouth, but conduct reveals what side of the cross you're on. Conduct reveals what side of grace you are on. Conduct matters. And so those that don't have the right conduct, they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. They think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Jesus is coming back. We must remember that and we must live in light of that and we must anticipate that. We must be excited about that, but we also must be sober minded about those who are not ready for that. Ecclesiastes 7, 2 through 4, last portion of scripture. We've read this a few months ago. So now I read it again in the New Living Translation. This man of wisdom and opulence that had access to all things, makes these statements. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. It seems like a crazy concept for someone to say it's better to be at funerals than at parties. But the purpose is for us to understand is that everyone dies. It's appointed from once for man to die. And at a funeral, your temporal should be evoked or provoked and begin to consider and contemplate this reality that this is temporal. That the person in that casket is going to be you not too far from now. You say, oh, how dare you say not too far from your life is but a vapor that appears for just a moment and vanishes away. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. 
A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. And I preached from here before months ago for this season of sickness had and has the potential to be healthy for us. If you are like many in this society, this world, somebody that has passed, that has died close to you has happened this year. Some of it due to COVID, some due to other things as well. And there's just been an onslaught throughout the world of an anthem of death and sickness. And I'm not drawing one side or the other of politics and and scare and hysteria. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole right now. But the point is this, that sickness and death has been the mantra and the anthem of the hour. And that is not to cause us to cower in fear, but it should cause us to be provoked in mind about the reality of something called eternity. How should we then live? Because ironically, death has the ability to provoke us to better living. And we were just at a funeral this week of my wife's grandfather. And all these families that don't get together came together because of one common thread, death. Death is what united the living. And that moment of death is what provoked the thoughts of the living and considered those to contemplate and consider, hopefully more so, because it is what we ought to have happen in this moment that we are living in. I jotted down just a couple of names this year that people I knew or have impacted me that have provoked my way of thinking that have died. Eli Hernandez was someone that died this year from COVID-19, a mighty evangelist of the gospel. I did not know him on a personal level, but this man's ministry had an impact on me because he was the one that preached the revival where I got filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Same thing with Pastor Jared. And to see this man die just brought a reality that nobody is exempt from death. Danielle Elsie, who spent three years at this church, giving her time sacrificially as an intern and then a member and then moved forward into her ministry. She had a tragic death, did not die of COVID, but a tragic fall and death. And she has passed from this life into the next Quincy Coffey, another young man that came out here for a short season and walked around in this church and prayed and wept in these altars and through these pews and was going to be here this very week for the next 21 days in South Dakota for an internship, died tragically in a horrific accident. I think of Roy Barnhill, who just died this past week. Didn't know on a super personal level, but we knew each other. And he's been to this church. That man that many of you may have been there for that service when he came and preached the angel of Cornelius. And he gave that utterance when he began to preach under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That God did not give us this size building for it to remain empty, but for it. sacrifice. He made his own sacrifice. He didn't ask anyone to buy his plane ticket. He didn't ask anyone to get him a rental car. He didn't ask for an offering. He came all the way across from North Carolina and got here on his own time and his own dime because he felt a quickening in the Holy Ghost. A message for this church. I never prayed the angel of Cornelius with more uh, uh, compassion and faith, uh, faith than I did just the other day when I found out about his past I still believe that message and I still believe that fulfillment that it shall be as it was preached. And then yesterday, my my dear brother and sister that I love so dearly, Chris and Danielle Green, who you've prayed with me for. has been to this church multiple times and brought word after word that they're baby was born prematurely at 24 weeks, survived for a little over two, three weeks, and now just died yesterday. I I weep thinking about all this death that is 
I'm somewhat connected to. I'm not trying to selfishly attach myself to drama or attach myself to loss. But that loss should cause us to pause and to consider and think the things that get you so worked up, the things that get you so uh, uh, you're obsessed over and the things that begin to just, you know, seem so serious, really in the light of it all, in the weight of all things, they're trivial. They're insignificant. They pale in comparison. Death has a way of putting things back into perspective that I got one thing called life. I got one shot at it. And knowing that I only got this one moment on this earth for a short amount of time, how shall I then live? I refuse to live average. I refuse to live like everyone else in this world. I refuse to live like every other Christian. I want to be apprehended by what has apprehended me. I want to give myself more to God than I've ever given myself before because Jesus is coming back and he's coming back for a church and I intend to be a part of that church and I intend to get others added to the church. Uh, Let's stand together. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh. I don't fear death. I don't fear it. God forbid I get COVID and die. But I don't fear death. I'm ready. I'm ready. But at the same time, I don't want that to be such a statement and a thought where I presume and assume my readiness. So I die daily. I check my motives daily. I pray daily. Proverbs twenty twenty seven says the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. The Lord's light penetrates the human spirit, exposing every hidden motive. I die daily. I turn that flashlight on daily. God, I want to be made right with the things that are wrong. I want to correct that which is wrong. I want to live ready for eternity. But when I'm ready for eternity, I want to live for those who are not ready for eternity. How shall we live with our words, with our thoughts, with our relationships, and down the list? How shall we then live? Jesus is coming back. I, I, it's not a statement. I just, I'm increasingly more and more disappointed and disinterested with this world. I just don't love it. I don't want to love the things of this world. Because if I love the world and things of the world, John the Apostle said, the love of the Father is not in me. And I want the love of the Father in me. That's not that we have to neglect our responsibilities on this earth. You still need to take care of your family. You still need to go to work. You still have all the things you got to take care of. But how are you living in the midst of whatever responsibilities you have? How careless are you with your words? How often do we uncheck our thoughts that we entertain that we shouldn't entertain? How are your relationships with people? Is there forgiveness? Is there unity? Is there peace? And on and on and on we go. Jesus is coming back. Heaven is real. Hell is real. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And I want to take people with me. I am not their savior, but I want to let them know about the savior. I want to lead them to an altar of repentance. I want to see souls baptized with the Holy Ghost. I want to see souls baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. God, how shall I then live? How am I living in this whole scheme of death that's going on, God? I'm not exempt. I'm not exempt. 
God, you took servants from this earth like Eli Hernandez, Daniel, Elsie, Quincy, Coffee, Roy, Barnhill. Lord, you've taken away great people of God from this world. Lord, I don't know how much time I have, but the time I have, I want to live it right. Would you lift your hands and would you just talk to Jesus for a moment? How are you going to live today? How are you going to live today? Don't let the enemy of the thought of tomorrow bring about you a rejoicing that you ought not to rejoice about. I'm not promised tomorrow. Witnessing to that person next week may not even be an option because they may pass or you may pass or Jesus might come back. Working on that relationship may not ever get fixed if we just keep prolonging the inevitable. Thinking it's inevitable when really it's not. God, today, 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 today I will live. Today I will live holy. Today I will live godly. Today I will live peace. Today I will live as a witness. Today I will live. I will live for you, Jesus. I surrender my will. I surrender my way. I surrender my lifestyle. I surrender my thoughts. I surrender my words. I surrender my relationships. I surrender, Jesus. Lord, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender all. Ah, I want to live. I want to live. I want to live right. I want to live right with eternity in mind. I want to live right, God. Many are called. Few are chosen. Broad, wide is the way to destruction, many on it. Straight and narrow is the way, and few be on it to life everlasting. I want to be on the right road, and I want to pull people off the wrong road. God, help me. Help me, help me, help me, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of hell enlarging itself. I'm tired of it opening its mouth without measure. God, I want to put a limit on hell. Lord, I want to stop that enlarging of it, God. The harvest is plenteous, the labors are few. I pray, God, for the Lord of the harvest that you would send forth laborers, Jesus. I want to see souls saved. I want to see lives changed. I want to be a part, God, of a revival in the last hour. I want to be a part of revival in the last days. Lord, I don't want bitterness, Lord, to cause my soul to fail. That root of bitterness, God, I grab a hold of it and I choke the death of it right now. Lord, I uproot the root of bitterness and I cast it out. Lord, I forgive. I choose forgiveness. I choose forgiveness. I choose forgiveness. Lord, if I do not forgive, you will not forgive me. Lord, I choose to forgive. I choose, Lord, to forgive. I choose to reconcile. I choose to make right. I choose to fix. Lord, I want to be ready, God. I don't want to delay the choice. Lord, I don't want to delay the right course of action. I want to make the right course of action today. I want to make the right course of action today. I will delay no longer. I will delay no longer. Come on, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let the Spirit speak through you. Let the Spirit work on your heart right now. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, make it right today. Make it right today. Make it right today. (laughs) I forgive. Lord, I ask for forgiveness. I ask God that you forgive me for my thoughts. Lord, my thoughts, Lord, of foolishness, they are sin. My words, God, they have been sin. Wash me, purge me, cleanse me, purify me. Lord, you take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they would turn. Lord, I turn. Lord, I turn. I turn, I turn, I turn.